Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Coming off another great homestand for the Flames, we're back for another week of Fireside Chat. How you doing, Matt? Awesome. Interesting week for the Flames last week. We both thought they were going to do well. We had uh, four points that we got out of a total of six. I don't think anybody can be unhappy with how that week went down. What do you think? No, and even in the game that they did lose to the Sharks, they were the better team for about 50 minutes in that game. It's just they got running around a bit, and that's what cost them. But, yeah, they were great again this week. They're keeping it up. It's good. Congrats to Bob Hartley. The game against his former team, the Avalanche, on Thursday of last week, December 4th, was Hartley's 400th NHL win, and the guys appropriately gave him the fireman's helmet afterwards. Yeah, he said he would trade that in for the playoffs easily, so hopefully... Let's make the trade. Yeah. For a living, pick up the phone and get her done. Um, yeah, no, I, I think it was good that the players acknowledged that. I think it's the players kind of, you know, by giving them that fireman's hat, I think they're really showing how behind their coach they are this year. Yeah, and the Flames seem to have that all-for-one, one-for-all mantra, and you can see that when somebody will score an important goal for themselves, like, everybody is in on it, and, like, everybody's pleased. Like, when Juris had the hat-trick goal, like, he was getting mobbed at the bench. So, it's nice to see. You know, I, th- I feel like that's something we've seen since Bob Hartley came to this team. When Sutter was the coach, we didn't see that kind of team spirit being put into place. And when Hartley first came here, we saw on the website videos of the team going and doing team building exercises they went through the Calgary Firemen's training in pairs and I just feel like Hartley and you know probably now uh, management as well but Hartley being the front line of that I think he's really working on the players of becoming one unit together yeah I recall back uh, the right after the Flames started their rebuild at a season ticket holder meeting that uh, Craig Conroy was mentioning a story about when Ben Hanowski first joined the team. And, like, everybody went to lunch, and, like, they kind of left him around going, uh, where am I supposed to go? And, uh, like, after that, like, the Flames started instituting having that winning culture where everybody is inclusive, and... We're starting to see the effects of that on the ice where everybody is on the same page and has each other's backs. For sure. This year and last year especially, the Flames have seemed like they've had less freelancing than they did when we had Iggy and Bo Meester and those kind of guys here. During that era, it always seemed like there were guys that were just out for themselves and not necessarily for the better of the team. And since Hartley's come in here and really been able to put his stamp on this team, I think that's the one big thing I've noticed is the group seems like they're one tight unit. There's nobody out there freelancing trying to do their own thing. I agree entirely. And that's where uh, the Flames were more like a team like the New York Rangers from the early 2000s where they had, like, the star players and then, like, that's it. It's a good comparison. And, you know, you can't have a collection of individuals. That won't work. You know, it might work in a game like baseball where... You know, uh, a guy can hit a home run and change a game, but in hockey, you need all 20 of your skaters out there doing the same job, pulling in the same direction. And I think on a year like we're having this year, where we're seeing so many players brought up from the farm, we are not seeing the egos around that. Like, everybody's playing with each other, and you know we're not seeing the NHL guys saying, well, I'm not going to pass to the, the call-up guy, or, you know, he shouldn't be on my line or anything like that. Like, everyone's just accepting of, this is the team that we have. These are the players that are in a flaming sea. Let's go out there and do it together. And, again, something I think if we didn't have the mentality we have now, we wouldn't be as successful with the cards that we've been dealt. Well, it's like uh, what Hoodler's reaction was when uh, Furland and Granlund got recalled. 
Hartley said to him that, oh, Ferlin, we're going to put him on your line. And he's like, oh, great. And then said, well, you need a center, so we're going to put Granlin there. And he's like, oh, that's awesome. Great. Let's go. That's the kind of attitude that you need from your veterans. Well, and, and he's also said that he now feels like he's 18 again, hanging out with all these young kids. Yeah, and like everybody just seems to be happy to be here entirely. Uh, like, yeah, there doesn't seem to be the any results. Egos. As, yeah, the results aside, like it, it seems like it's just a fun environment where everybody can just basically be themselves and not have to put up with the dressing room politics from years gone by. Well, you know, and you say results aside, and I would be interested to see how this team would be looking to the general public if we were having different results. I think a lot of the reason why everyone is so jovial and so happy is because they're seeing the success there. True. And it winning is always better than losing. <laughs> For sure. But I, I just think that we wouldn't see as many smiles all the time if this team was terrible. Oh, no, of course not. We'd be seeing the looks on the, the players' faces like we've seen with basically all of Edmonton's franchise. Very true. Well, talking about our franchise, um, some been a slow week for Flames news this week, but I think the biggest news item is the fact that the sick bay is starting to empty out. Uh, Stajan we saw play last week. He played against the Sharks. Um, Mason Raymond is expected to make his return this week against the Maple Leafs. And Joel Colborn's on the road trip. So it looks like we're going to see three of our top players back in the lineup this week the question then becomes what do we do right now we have 25 active players so two guys have to go down to the farm matt what do you think is going to happen how do you think the flames are going to get to their 23-man roster well it's one of those things that it's unfortunate because everybody has been playing so well but i think the guys that are able to clear waivers without having to be placed on them will be the ones that go down, and the two that have been the least impressive of that group are Berchi and Furland. The Flames have told Josh Juris apparently to find a, a home in Calgary, so that's a good a, a indication that he's going to be staying up here. So congrats to him. Yeah, he's going to be rooming with Gaudreau. There you go, and they just told Gaudreau to find a place not too long ago, so it's good to see those two together. Yeah. So you think Berchi and Ferland will go down? Makes sense because none of them have to clear waivers. And I think it's currently Monday night. The fact we haven't seen somebody put on waivers yet is also a good indication that one of those guys is going to go down. Yeah, and with those guys, like, yes, you might like to see them remain in Calgary because despite not getting points, they have been pretty good. But it's what's better for them like are, they're only going to get seven to eight minutes a night on the fourth line because of the newfound depth so is that better than say 15 minutes a night in Adirondack yeah I'd rather send Berchi and Furlan down and like you said have them play you know 15 to 18 minutes a night as a top star there and try to keep up that that offensive I, I guess the offensive touch that maybe they don't have at the NHL level, see if we can get them scoring again and contributing on offensively and helping to build up their players and as a development, I think it's going to be better for their development going down. Yeah, and we've seen with each of those guys where they've made great plays that just miss, and so hopefully if they go back to Adirondack, they can start figuring out ways of getting those plays to work. For sure. It seems like the team lost every centerman they had, except for Monaghan, and so for a while, Marcus Granlin kind of jumped in as the default second-line center for the Flames. You think Granlin stays up here for a bit? Yeah, he hasn't done anything that warrants him going down, and he also has some flexibility because he can play on the wing as well. For sure. So a couple other scenarios the Flames could run with. Um... If we look down the roster, and we sort of made mention of this last week, what would you think if the Flames were to wave Brian McGratton and send him down? I would be disappointed for him, but for his what he brings to the team, he wouldn't be a bad option to get rid of. I feel like since Brian Bolig joined the team, it's made Gratton a little bit more expendable. 
Yeah, you basically got the same guy, but Bully can actually play a shift without hurting you too badly, where McGratton, he does. Yeah, I, th- I think that McGratton is your stereotypical tough guy. He's the bruiser on the team, where Bolig is a hockey player that is also a tough guy, almost like what we're trying to model Brandon Prust into when he was a flame. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I would, I mean, I agree with you. I'd be sad to see it. Um, for Calgary fans, I think Brian McGratton, knowing his dynamic personality and the fact that we've grown to love him here in Calgary, I think it could be good for Adirondack to have a guy like that in the roster, in the room, talking to the media. But, yeah, I could see them sending Gratz down or at least waving Gratz in order to keep one of the kids up here. And if you wave him, it also gives you a little bit more flexibility as far as moving guys up and down because now you've got one more guy who's cleared waivers and can stay on the NHL roster for 30 days. True. Um, You think Bowling spot is safe? For the time being. Uh, the only guy that's in the organization, really, that I could see displacing him at in anywhere ne- in the near future would be Furland, just because they play that kind of physical, banging type forward. I agree. Furland does have more upside, though. If you asked me at the beginning of the year, I would have said the guy that would probably um, unseat him would would possibly be David Wolf, but I haven't been impressed with what I've seen from Wolf so far. Well. Wolf's been a bit up and down, and when he just got off of injury and then he got hurt again, and he scored a couple of times. He's not great, but he's not bad. He's just kind of there. Yeah. Um, another possibility that when I was looking through the roster that I thought of, Pat Steinberg says this guy's been the most consistent forward all year, but what would you think, Matt, if the Flames were to take Paul Byron and wave him? I would actually be kind of pissed if they did that. He's He hasn't been capitalizing when he's been getting breakaways, but the sheer number of breakaways that he's been getting, that is something that could be useful for the team moving forward. And he's been primarily used as a penalty killer, and he has been doing a decent job with that. There's worse players that you can get rid of first. Yeah, I agree with you. I feel like for... Most of his time here, Byron's always got the short end of the stick. Every time it seemed like he was ready to stick with the team, he never did. And I think he hasn't done enough poorly this year to say that he should go down. And I think if if nothing else, he made the team out of camp, and I think he should stay here for now and send, you know, Berchi or Furland or both down um, and let them play some more of the HL because I feel like Byron's paid his dues at this point. Yeah, he basically reminds me a lot of David Jones sans the injuries. <laughs> you know, like a five foot six wrecking ball, which that's what David Jones's game is when he is healthy. Yeah, no, that's true. And and I think we're starting to see from Paul Byron this year, at least I am, I'm starting to see him become a more complete player. I think in the past when we've just seen him as a call up we never really got to see who Paul Byron was. And I feel like this year we're starting to see him develop as an NHL player and starting to understand what kind of a player he's going to be going forward. Mm -hmm. He's looking a lot better than Nigel Dawes. Oh, for sure. The last, you know, the last short guy that was kind of a two way winger. Yeah. Good, good comparison. So I think you're right. The fact that, you know, nobody's been sent down yet on waivers that the Flames will probably send Furland and or Berchi down tomorrow morning uh, when they get to Toronto. And I think that's probably where they'll keep it for now. But I think now we know what we've got, at least in the forward group. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was a talk with the with the guys that are still left for in Flaming Seas saying, guys, these jobs are yours to lose now. Like, we just sent down two guys who deserve to be here have shown us that. So show us that we shouldn't bring them back up. Yeah, and like that's uh, also a challenge for the players that got sent down. Like, okay, we beat Setaguchi, so okay, now the, like the next on your hit list is say Matt Stajan or David Jones, and okay, we need to be better than this guy in or now in order to be in the NHL. Yeah, and I think it also now shows them what's required to play at the NHL level. And I would love to be in their room tomorrow when they have a discussion with. Tra living, uh, you know, kind of saying, I would imagine if you're playing this way at the NHL level and you can play the exact same way in the AHL level, you're going to have a fantastic season. Yeah, exactly. 
Like, we've seen, like, with Reinhardt getting sent down, like, he's been pretty much on fire ever since he's been back down there. And I'm sure that if Berchi and Furlan go back, like, they'll be tearing it up. You hope so. And you almost hope that there's a, a bit of a almost a brotherhood among those guys, the guys that have now had that NHL taste and want to get back there, and some friendly competition among them to, I don't want to say go out and freelance and show they're the best, but to kind of be one up in each other, almost competing and say, I want to be the next guy called up. Not at the expense of the team, but just trying to make themselves look like, you know, hey, call me up. Yeah, it's just the exact same thing that uh, Hiller and Ramo are doing. Yeah. Just with forwards. Good point. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It's, hey, we're the three guys, you know, or four guys that made it to the NHL this year. They, we need to compete to show that we should get back up there. And competition is not a bad thing. And I, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing all these guys back in Adirondack because they're having a great year so far, and I can't wait till they get some firepower back. Yeah, like if you subtract those five or six games at the start of the year where like everything was screwing up for them that could possibly Let's go wrong. Let's just forget wrong. about like, those they've ones. Been, you know, they've been just lights out ever since. Yeah. And especially like if they get their two of their leading scorers back in Furland and Berchi, like they'll they'll be a real pain in the ass for everybody else to play. Yeah, and it'll be fun hockey to watch too. So talking about roster moves, um, we all know that Brian Burke has always done something a little bit unconventional among his peers. He always puts in a, a Christmas roster freeze outside of the one the league mandates. And he said that his roster freeze is going to start on December 12th this year, which is this coming Friday. Um, with seeing these some of these guys come back from injury, seeing some of the players moving around, do you anticipate the Flames making any moves this week? Any deals with other teams before that roster freeze that Burke's imposing? No, not really. I don't see any trades imminent. And uh, with the kids possibly going down, I think that would basically be it. And I like what Burke does with having the extra week or whatever for the roster freeze. It, it's nice for the players. Yeah, it's good for their families because, like, they can expect, oh, they'll be in New York or, oh, they'll be here, not, you know, all over the place. Yeah, and I think, you know, in the modern day and age, not many trades are made that there's not been some rumor of. And I've been out looking today and over the weekend, and I haven't seen much legitimate from confirmed sources talk at all of the flames close to anything so i think you're probably right i don't think they'll get anything done before that i would not be surprised if Trilliving's talking and has something you know in the works but yeah i don't see them rushing to get it done by friday yeah and likely that would be seeing probably a forward or two getting dispatched elsewhere just to open spots for kids. I think, too, if I'm true living, I want to wait until my core roster is brought back to see what they can do. I mean, some of these guys got hurt so early in the year, we really haven't seen much of them. And I think, yeah, you're saying to these guys that are coming back, hey, we've got someone on the farm ready to replace you, so you better be ready to go. But I think you've got to give them, you know, three, four games to at least reassess what you've got in these players. Oh, yeah, definitely. And... That'll likely, like, if you're going to see a roster move like that, you'll, it'll probably be mid-January at the earliest. Yeah, yeah, I, I could see the Flames coming back from their New Year's hiatus. I think their um, their roster freeze is over on the 27th, Burke's roster freeze. So I could see somewhere in the first week of January something happening. But it, it, it'll, it'll be interesting to see what happens, let's put it that way. I don't think we're going to see anything this week, but I just... I have this feeling in the back of my head, like, we're going to see a trade fairly soon, and I think it's going to be something of substance. It just feels like we need a roster move to happen fairly soon. Well, likely, like, if we're going to add anybody, I think the Flames will be targeting a defenseman just because the third pairing has been quite terrible for most of the year. Yeah, fair point. I, I can see that. I think you're right. They'll pro I mean, we know now that they have forwards that there's no point in going out and acquiring another forward. It's not like we need anybody there. No, uh, 
Like, ideally, you'd get another guy of Hoodler's caliber, but why would you bother at this point during the season to acquire somebody like that? I would imagine, too, that after seeing how our call-ups have been playing, I imagine GMs are going to want a piece of that. And if you call them wanting something, they're probably going to want us to throw one of those guys in. Oh, yeah. And you never know. Like, it, Look at what uh, the Sharks and Stars did sending Demers for Dylan. Like, you could conceivably make a similar-ish trade involving a forward or two. Yeah, I wouldn't be opposed to see one or two of these forwards shipped out to get a uh, top four defenseman in here. Yeah. Like, if you can shelter Weidman's defensive ability on the third pairing instead, then and plug that new acquisition on the second pairing with Russell, then you've got two really good solid pairings and then the third pairing which you can isolate a bit and i think the flames probably have to change their acquisition strategy now i imagine going into this season trillivan was primarily making calls to be a seller and i think if you look at where the flames are at we have to look at now strengthening the roster well no actually i'm actually of the opposite opinion that they should still be in seller mode but the end target is different. Like, if you can acquire a legit player for a player that you would be selling anyway, like, say, like, Glenn Cross, just as an example, because he's UFA, instead of, like, targeting, oh, I want a two second-round draft picks, instead, like, target that good young defenseman or something... I agree with you there, yeah, but I think the difference between that is I think when you're in seller mode, the for sale sign is on everything, and True. and I think you're right, we have to make strategic moves, if we're going to move somebody, we're looking for a different return on it, but I don't think that we just keep the doors open anymore and say, make me an offer for anyone on the roster. And like, uh, the team that I could see the Flames dealing with, probably the easiest, the uh, hypothetical would be Pittsburgh. Uh, because they have like four or five good defensemen that are on the cusp. Yeah. Where you could trade a Glenn Cross for. You think they want England back? I doubt it. Yeah, no, I, I think that there's definitely a couple trading partners. Pittsburgh's one. Um, I could see the Flames and the Avalanche doing something. Um, just because I think the Avalanche need to get kickstarted, and I wouldn't be surprised to see them do something big soon. But I think that. What we look at as a big trade this year is going to be different than the past. I don't necessarily think we're going to be bringing in a top flight player. I think when the when the trade eventually gets made, the first trade of the year, it's going to be to free up a roster spot for someone on the farm. And I think it's almost going to be making a statement that, wow, you know, David Jones or Matt Stajan or somebody like that is gone. And Reinhardt has their spot now. And I think it's going to be more like that of, okay, we've now moved on an NHL player acquired a prospect or an asset but didn't get the NHL player back it's done to bring up our own guys yeah I agree and how can you blame them like you look at what Poirier or Hanowski have done since all these recalls like they've been just lights out so I just think that we're the hand of true living is going to be forced he's going to be looking around saying I have to bring up one maybe two guys and I got to move somebody to do that. And normally, if you're trading away a guy to bring in a farm guy, it's usually a stopgap. But I think this year, it's like, wow, we've got so much talent on the forward ranks that, yeah, his hand's going to be forced at some point. And somebody's going to have to move. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that normally a team doesn't have like 14 or 15 good forward prospects all at the same time. Yeah. Like, it's ridiculous like you look at a guy like say Kenny Agostino and it's like we haven't talked about him all year and yet he's been all right in that or on deck but like there's just so many other guys that you know we're starting to see players getting lost in the sauce just because we have like almost a full NHL roster worth of good for young forwards that are all just 
lights out thus far. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think if the guys that got recalled hadn't have been recalled, I don't think that they necessarily would have got as much talk. And I think that, yeah, the spotlight's not being shone on a lot of guys that maybe need that spotlight there because their work needs to be rewarded and seen by fans just because there's four or five guys we've been focusing on because they're wearing a flaming sea. Exactly. Like it's actually quite amazing how much depth the Flames have up front. It's every time I think about it, I have to smile because we went from the team that everyone said had nothing in the cupboards to now looking around, going, "We don't have enough roster spots for all the talent we have." Yeah, like honestly, I'm beginning to draw comparisons to the amount of depth that the Flames had in the '80s for the amount of forward depth and talent. It's absolutely ridiculous. You know, I was reading the the Sun today, and they were talking about how the the NHL might be announcing a expansion fairly soon. And the first thing that came to my head is crap, because we're gonna have a whole bunch of players that are probably gonna have to be unprotected in an expansion draft. Yeah, and see you, Stajan, or you know anybody over the age of twenty five, other than Giordano. Like basically, all the young players keep them everybody else yeah that would be who you'd expose on a, in a situation like that well and even to trades this year i think anyone that's you know not anyone over 25 anyone that's not playing up to where they're expected is probably going to be shopped and what a what a good time for flames fans to have a team where everyone who's on the roster literally has to fight for their life yeah it's so ridiculous because there's like five or six guys that you could plug in tomorrow that haven't been in the NHL this season that could play in the NHL. And how many times as Flames fans have we seen guys in our team that don't look like they want to be there, that don't have the right compete level, but we have nobody else to put in there? Oh, I know. It's absolutely amazing. Well, staying on the same topic, if one of these guys were to get called up, or potentially Josh Juris, who's now sticking around, they're obviously going to need a New Jersey number. Now, they've said Juris will keep wearing 86 till the end of the year, but... We know that Brian Burke made it very clear at the beginning of the year that he only wants permanent guys wearing numbers 1 to 35. And there was some discussion today on Calgary Puck of people looking around saying, what numbers are actually available for players to wear? Matt, do you think it's safe to assume that 12, 14, and 34 are off limits? Until they get the forever aflame treatment, then yes. Right, because they won't be retired. They'll be forever aflame. Which, that's kind of a cop-out, but... Yeah. Do you think it's fair to assume the two is off limits? Well, it's been used since. It has, and 25's now been worn as well, which was Neuendijk's number. So let's assume that for right now, 12, 14, 34 are out of play. 30's been retired. By my count, that leaves 28 and 35 available for players to wear. I know. That's where it's getting to be a little difficult because you have seven or eight numbers that are kind of off limits sort of out of the 35 and I think that what will need to happen is that 35 might need to get expanded to 40. Yeah see I mean I'm still not a and 40 makes sense because then when Monaghan comes up he can be 39 which was Gilmore's number. Bennett. Bennett. Oh sorry when Bennett when Sam Bennett comes up Uh, He can wear number 39, which was Gilmore's number, instead of 93, which is what he wears now. But I think it's going to get tough even with 40. I mean, we've got guys in the farm like Watherspoon who have a number. If all these guys are playing well this year or given numbers next year, we're going to be... I mean, we've only got two numbers, 28 or 35. I don't want to be a skater wearing 35, so that leaves 28. We're going to run out of numbers, and even if we go to 40, there's not a lot of great numbers left. That gives us, what, 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40 available. To me, I, I just I don't get it. Like, if Bennett comes along and wants to wear 93, let him wear 93. If Berti wants to wear 47, let him wear 47. Yeah, I, I don't understand what the big deal is. Burke but... says it's old school, but it's 2014. Yeah, and back then, like, it, w- your number was kind of based off of your rank in the team and like the lower your number the better player you were but yeah it's 2014 and you see a lot of these teams like Anaheim, Montreal, 
others where like they got most of their players are like in the 40s or higher and I don't see a problem with that. No, and I think Montreal's a good example there. Like I was doing some research on this last week and okay, I can see Berkey wanting to go with old school as he says, but look at the original six teams, the old school teams. I mean, if I look at the Canadians roster for example, they've got a 58, a 49, a 51 and 81, uh 67 and you know 74 77 55 79 76 and 43 all as active numbers so if anyone's going to be old school it would be you know the original six and if even they're letting people use all the other numbers i don't see why we shouldn't well the thing is is that they have a lot of numbers retired yeah that's the problem and toronto actually did something right where the only numbers that got retired are players that died while being a part of the team, and everybody else just got honored from day one instead of uh, retiring jerseys in the first place. And, like, that's why Calgary's kind of screwed up, because they retired and then they didn't, and, like, it kind of messed things up a bit, but... See, to me, I think part of establishing an identity as a player can be wearing a unique number. Like, if you look at Toronto, I think, you know, David Clarkson wearing 71, Phil Kessel wearing 81. I think those are almost become part of the player's identity, having these funky numbers that are non conformist. Yeah, like Lindros 88, Lemieux 66. Even Berchi at 47. Yeah, it's a little different. And, like, even in basketball, like, all different players wear all sorts of numbers and like there's not even the amount of players on their roster that's on an NHL roster so I don't know Uh, I just think the whole thing is stupid I think the whole thing is stupid and I think it'll have to go by the wayside by the end of the year it's okay like I I don't see the point of emphasizing it personally like it who cares it's a number well, I think of all things for the president of hockey operations to be concerned about, the number on the back of a guy's jersey, I think, is probably not one of those things that really should concern him. I know. Like, he was uh, complaining that the Flames players didn't want to play in the third jerseys last year. Well, that's kind of equally much ado about nothing. Like, who cares? That's it. And, you know, to me, if we all know hockey players are superstitious, if a guy thinks he's going to play better wearing 93 or 47, to me, I'm going to say, yeah, fine, wear it. If you think that's going to make you a better player, my job is to get the best out of you. Yeah. Anything that works is A-OK in my books, as long as it works. <laughs> so, yeah, I just thought we'd bring that up. It's kind of interesting that there's really only two numbers available then, which is uh, 28 and 35. So, you know, anyone that's, if we're going to have more than one of these guys make the team next year, we're going to run out of numbers. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. They'll probably raise it to 40 or hopefully just raise it to 98 like every other team in the league. True. Simple is better. <laughs> we we were looking earlier today at uh, some of the players that have worn some of those numbers. Like 35 is a goalie number. but And it has been. It's been, you know, a set of goalies. Um, the Flames have their all-time numbers on the website. Stu Grimson wore it. But since then, it's Jeff Reese, Andre Trefloff, Kay Whitmore, who I forgot was a Flames goalie till I read this, Brent Cron, Carlson, Joy McDonald. I'd hate to be a winger wearing 35. Yeah. I know. It just, like, ever since Richter wore it, like, that's basically been just, like, emblematic goalie number. Like, it, yeah. you know, like, it, you don't see, like, 30, 31, and 35, like, those to me are goalie numbers for sure. Yeah, I would say the 33 as well from Moi. Yeah, true enough. Um, But, you know, I mean, I would hate to be the next guy in the Flames roster who gets saddled with number 12 because they're out of other numbers too. Like, I think that's such an iconic number right now for the Flames. I wouldn't want to go out skating in 12. No, it's just like how uh, Penguins fans were pissed off when TJ Brody first made the NHL and was wearing number 66. Just because that was his training camp number. I'm surprised they even issued that in camp. I would have gone 65 and 67 and just skipped 66. True. But, you know, like, it, it's... I don't know. Like, to me, like, either retire all the jerseys or none. 
and just issue them to everybody and who cares i don't know yeah no i i I know where you're coming from but i just yeah i I just thought it was an interesting note to bring up is that we're running out of numbers and burke's plan i don't think he expected to have as many guys cycling through the roster as he does and his plan may backfire by the end of the year Oh yeah, especially with the quality of the players. Like ew, we've already seen Gaudreau and uh, Juris lock down spots, and Granlin's probably not far behind. Yeah, for sure. And Granlin will wear eighty six for the rest of the year, um, and it'll be interesting to see if they make him change next year or not. Apparently, he wants a jersey with a seven in it, and right now there's really no nothing available. Yeah, he might have to go try to buy a seven from somebody. Well, it, he could wear number 37 if they upgrade it to 40. So I forget the whole story. When Bertuzzi came here, I think he wanted number 44 and Warner was wearing it or something. Yeah, somebody was so wearing he, it. He ended up buying Warner a car to get it from him, I guess. I remember hearing a story about that as Warner joked with him, you, you know, you couldn't get it from me unless I, you know, you got me a new Mustang or something. The next day there was a Mustang in the parking lot. Well, didn't. Uh he end up wearing number seven Bertuzzi yeah um could be it was whoever was wearing his number it was he had to buy it from that guy I forget who it was um let me go take a look Todd Bert yeah Todd Bertuzzi wore seven here so I'd have to go back and check but whoever he got it from he ended up having to pay them for it uh, and you know by buying them something so I uh, that story always sticks in my mind when I think about guys getting the numbers they want oh yeah well, Matt, it's been a fairly slow week for the Flames. Um, I think we've pretty much covered everything that there is with the Flames this past week, but there's been some interesting news up north. The Oilers held a press conference last week, and I guess in usual Oilers style didn't say a whole lot of anything, but there's one quote that stuck out to you especially. What was that quote from Craig McTavish? He said during the confer- press conference that visually we are a better hockey team. And I think our most ardent detractor would have to admit that we are a better hockey team visually. What does that mean? Yeah, I... Is he saying that we're better on paper than we're playing? Well, I think the Oilers' problem is that they are conflating skill with talent. And the Oilers have a lot of skilled players. Hall, Nugent Hopkins, Yakupov, Eberle, all very skilled players. But for actual NHL on-ice talent, they are terrible. And they do not have a cohesive system and game plan that... Well, you've seen how many times that this year where, like, three or four guys are grouped together around one guy and, like, there's a guy wide open in front of the net that bangs the puck in. Well, that's not a talented team. And until they can figure out exactly why that's not working properly, like, a swarm defense should only be on, like, point shots where the goalie's got the puck in front of them and, like, the forwards come down low to make sure that nobody can bang in a rebound. That's the only time. And yet, the Oilers seem to swarm all over the place, and I don't know. Like, I I think that the coaching staff needs to go, and probably the management. Like, it, it's sort of like a corollary to the Calgary Flames before, where they tried everything, and then eventually they just said enough and they traded again and the rest of the core and just changed everything. And I think the Oilers kind of need to do what I mentioned earlier what with what Conroy said, where, okay, we need to get a winning attitude and, like, where everybody is on the same page and fights for each other, not a group of individuals, which is what the Oilers have become. I've always felt, like, for the last five years, I felt that way. They're putting very talented pieces together and almost saying to those guys, okay, we've got talented pieces, now you guys figure out how to work together. And I think there's no identity of the Oilers today. If you look at that team, what is their identity? What is it they're going for? What is their game plan? 
So I agree with you. I think they need new coaching. I think they probably need new management. And they need to do what the Flames did by saying, this is the identity that we're going to have. And we had to make some hard choices. We had to get rid of some people that didn't fit that identity. But I think, yeah, they have to go that way. Say, this is what the Edmonton Oilers are. And if you're not willing to be part of that, pack your bags and we'll send you somewhere else. Well, the problem that the management has is that they're stuck in the only time that that build of a team worked. When you had the superstars of the 80s, you could tell them to go out and get creative. Yeah, exactly. If you got Gretzky and Messier on your team, yeah, of course. Do whatever the hell you want. You're going to win with those and guys. And I, I have a feeling Sather probably didn't give them a lot of instruction. No, and you got McTavish and Lowe there, and they were on those teams. So yeah, they would know exactly what happened. And the problem is, is that Taylor Hall, Hopkins, and all the rest of the guys, they are not Gretzky and Messier. And there hasn't been a Gretzky, arguably, other than Crosby, since then. So they're not as good as they think they are. And because it's not the 1980s anymore... That team is floundering, and it's really unfortunate both for the fans but also for the players themselves because they're not being put in a proper position to succeed. And, you know, like I don't like to see talented players, like, you know how hard it is to make the NHL. Like, these guys have a lot of talent. Like, it, it just seems like such a waste when they're not being given the right direction. I honestly think that the change for the Oilers is going to come within. I think that we're going to start seeing one or two of these guys say, I want out, and force the Oilers' hand to move them. And then that might be what it takes to start a proper rebuild there. Yeah, and like that's why I'm kind of hoping that the top three guys in the draft all kind of say, like, we, are, we won't go to Edmonton. Just because like that will make them have to confront the problems that they have within. But even guys like Hall and Eberle and Nugent Hopkins at some point are going to want out of that. I mean, they don't want to be on a team that's losing forever. And I think one of those three is going to step up probably this year, maybe at the deadline and say, move me. Well, yeah. And you got to figure it's going to hurt their bottom line too, because their contracts are going to come up. And like, especially a guy like Yakupov who has, I think seven or eight points this year. Well, if you look in past number one overall picks, like guys like Tavares and uh, Stamkos in their third season had like 80 and 90 points, not seven. And on pace for like 30. It's frustrating to see a team doing that bad for that long, I think. Well, you know it's bad when two Calgary Flames fans that have been Flames fans for a very long time are pissed off with how bad the Edmonton Oilers are. You know, when when I was looking at the rebuild of the Flames, the first thing I was thinking is, we're, we're going to beat Edmonton to this, and then the Battle of Alberta is going to be awesome again. Yeah. Like, I thought we are going to rebuild kind of side by side. We were going to beat them just because we're the Flames, and I like it when we do stuff better. But, yeah, I thought we were going to rebuild side by side, and these two teams were going to have great Battle of Alberta and almost race each other to see who can make the postseason first again. Yeah, and instead, they're in full tank mode for McDavid again, like the story of the last five years. And Calgary has basically gone through the full rebuild and are on their way up again. What worries me is I love having hockey in Edmonton. I think it's a great hockey market. I think the people there love it. And it makes me worry that if they keep doing this, there may not be a team in Edmonton for too long. I mean, people can't ha- can't be wanting to pay their hard-earned money to see this team. Well, I'm actually hoping that the fans vote with their wallet or if they've already paid for their tickets to just not go because they need to force the hand of the owner to make changes because you can't have this repetitive bs for they're nine years out of the playoffs like they're one year behind florida for the nhl record for longest playoff drought and honestly even if they everything went right i think they're three or four years out of the playoffs like you can't have that 
like it, it gets to the point where it's an embarrassment to the NHL and it affects the NHL's credibility for allowing a team to be like that. Yeah, no, I agree with you, and I think it it goes to larger things that the league has to look at as far as reforming maybe how the draft lottery works, maybe only allowing you to be in the lottery for so many years at a time and say, okay, you've had four cracks at the number one pick, now figure out another way to rebuild because obviously this isn't working. Um, but yeah, I think you, you were right what you said earlier. We're concerned. Like, we're Calgary fans, and we're concerned about the Oilers. Yeah, like, it, it was funny at first. Because, give me a break, it's Edmonton, ha-ha, you know, all that. But it gets to a point where it's not funny anymore. Like, even the New York Islanders, who rebuilt roughly at around the same time, they figured it out. They're the top, one of the top teams in the East. What the heck is your problem? (laughs) Yeah, no, it's true. And I think it's the fact that the Oilers seem to have stopped caring that really... I think affects me if they were trying every year and just, you know, bad luck, had a string of injuries, didn't get anywhere for one year, that'd be one thing. No, no, but, no. Then you wouldn't complain at all because, okay, you just happen to fluke out and suck again. Big deal. Yeah, Who but cares? it's the fact they just don't seem to want to get any better. No. And, like, even last night when they won, the only goal that the Sharks scored you had three Oilers rushing back, and they were all facing the uh, guy who had the puck. And the goalie's pointing to the guy that's wide open, that's like five feet away from the closest Oilers player, where if he just made a quick turn and put his stick out, he would have blocked the pass. Instead, it goes right to the guy, and the puck's in the net. And, like, that's Justin Schultz's fault, because he was the closest guy. Why... How is that still happening? Like it, you, it, it gets to the point of how, how. And I think until we get a mutiny from the players by a bunch of them saying they want out, I think really nothing's going to change until the office changes there. Yeah, and like it's frustrating because you, you know, this is a supposed to be a happy event, going to a hockey game, watching a hockey game. You cheer for your team, hopefully they win, if they don't, oh well, you know. But, like, this is a gong show of epic proportions, and it's gone on long enough. You know, like, I don't like to advocate people losing their jobs, but, like, something has to change. I I don't know exactly what the solution would be, who should get fired, should they, you know, who should they trade, this, that, the next thing. They have to do something. Like, it's gotten to the point, it's well past the point of having to do something. Well, it's time to wrap up then. This is the first time in, I think, four weeks that we haven't had three games in a week. We have four this week, and we're on an Eastern Conference swing for the first three. It's a four-game road trip in Toronto, Buffalo, Pittsburgh, and then Chicago. Eight points on the table. How do you think we're going to do, Matt? Four. I'll go halfway. You think we'll come home at 500 on the road trip? Yeah, I I think they'll split each of the two game segments. Uh, so Toronto, win or loss? I'll go with a loss there. They'll beat Buffalo, they'll beat Pittsburgh, and they'll lose to Chicago. I'd be really impressed if they win the back-to-back Buffalo-Pittsburgh series. It's always tough to win back-to-backs. We'll see. I, I think they're going to probably do four. I think that they're going to beat Buffalo, and I think they're going to beat Chicago. Yeah. I think that... Uh, the back to back's going to kill them, but they've already beaten the Hawks, and um, I think that they can probably do it again. That's also an early game on Sunday, which is nice. Yeah. Well, the Pittsburgh game, uh, they, the Penguins have run into some really bad injury troubles lately, so that's why I think we might have a chance there. Could be. Could be. And I guess Hiller will be starting in Toronto, so Ramos' uh, reign is over and Hiller's reclaiming the net. Well, it's good, because you can't let Hiller sit on the shelf for too long. Let him get a good game in, and if he plays well, then give him the Pittsburgh game. If he doesn't, then give him the Buffalo game. (laughs) Good point. And I'm just looking forward to seeing some of these uh, Flames players come back from injury this week. It's going to be interesting to see what the Flames do roster-wise. Oh yeah, there will be a lot to discuss next week. 
And we will talk to you again, Matt, in the one day that we have between when the Flames take on the Blackhawks and when they take on the Rangers. Fun times. Have a good week, and we'll talk to you then. Take care, everybody. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.